Hi, handsome. How you going, guys? Hey, dude, bro. How's China? Man, it was, I mean, look, it, it was a whirlwind. You know, we were just like in and out. Had to, uh, yeah, just basically got there, got picked up, uh, drove to the show, played the show, and then drove back. But, I mean, we got put it up in a super nice hotel, which was crazy. There was a robot all in the lobby. On in the lobby, I saw a robot catch an elevator. That was Dude, really. I had yeah. the same thing in China. It blew my. Did I send that to you? No. Yeah, the, el- the robot comes in. Did it go like? Excuse me, I am going to level this. Did it do that for you? Uh no. I mean, maybe it did, but probably not in English. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was. Um, yeah. I th- people were like dropping off bags of Uber Eats in the robot, but then it was also just cleaning the floor in general. So that was pretty cool. And then uh, the day of the. Uh, the day of the show, we uh, ate. Uh, the promoter took us to this um, small, like, uh, family-owned um, Chinese restaurant. So the, the town we played at was like a smaller kind of town in the, in the countryside or whatever. Um, so the food at that at this restaurant was just incredible. It was just like homemade uh, Chinese uh, noodles, and like some of them oh, were like yeah. dry, and some of them were in a, in a beautiful broth, and then some dumplings, and oh man. It was, yeah, the meal of a lifetime, honestly. And then the show obviously was great. It was cool, you know. You yeah. got a chance um, to play with Dexcore. Yeah. Yeah, Dexcore. Yeah, we met those guys. They were super nice. Um, watched uh, quite a bit of their set. They, they they got the crowd going. You know, they got a wall of deaths going and everything, and they were just going off. It was it was sick. Yeah, really cool. cool. Fuck yeah. Does, um, so obviously, you know, when you get to go into so many places now, see so many different countries, do you enjoy like when you finally get somewhere like China, getting to try the authentic meal that's not like from a from a Chinese in a food court in Australia? And how vast is the difference? Yeah, I think that. I mean, when I when I travel uh, to uh, uh, you know, I guess non super Western countries, I'd say like food is the the t- uh, utmost priority for me, you know, that's always something that I'm the most interested in trying because I definitely am a foodie and and love eating. I mean, who doesn't? <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, I I had no idea what to expect when it came to um, Chinese food. I didn't know how sort of, you know, different it was going to be or from, you know, the, the food we get in the Chinese restaurants in Australia or whatever. Um, uh Honestly, a lot of it, it was, I mean, <clears throat> there was no, uh, <laughs> there was no like sweet and sour or anything like that, or at least we didn't see any, but um, that, like the, the, it just, it just tasted, I don't know, the, the same, but, you know, more authentic. It wasn't like out of a freezer or whatever. It was like, you know, that made it that day and stuff. It was just, yeah, it was great. Do you have any concerns about food poisoning, particularly when you're like in the lead up to a show? Cause that would play so heavily on me and I'm not even playing in a show. I'm just existing. And I'm just like, I can't afford to get food poisoning. I've got three days to do my job. J Man, J Man is two for two right now with um, buffalo chicken wings and food poisoning. <laughs> when we play, we uh, when we played the Brisbane show, he had food poisoning that day and was just in the hotel room the whole day um, on the toilet, <laughs> and then uh, managed managed to managed to pull himself off the toilet seat and get to the show. So that was good on him. But then um, when we were in the states, both J Man and I, we we ate at this bar in uh Worcester and we got some chicken wings there and then we both came down with what we think was like you know salmonella because it lasted uh, quite a while and we both you know it was you know the shakes and both had diarrhea about 10 minutes before we got on stage J-Man pooed his pants Oh, just sit no. there. Had to sit there. Oh. <laughs> he was laying there on the couch just fast asleep and then Alex was like shaking him like J-Man J-Man can we are you good to play the show? And he apparently just, he, just he, toughed it through it. Yeah, it just came out. I'm not sure. Oh, <laughs> I just oh, shook it out of it. Oh. Isn't that like the most humbling thing? It's like, yeah, we're we're all human, and if you have a bad bit of chicken, we all shit our pants. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But I mean, I think the impressive. I, I was so impressed. Well, I um, I fe- I woke up about two in the morning that night and felt that I was going to be sick. So I went into the bathroom and like forced myself to vomit and stuff. Yeah. J Man slept through the night. And then was feeling more of the repercussions of it the next day. So for him, it was much worse. And for me, it was just impressive that, you know, you can uh, shit your pants 10 minutes before you get on stage 
and then just walk on stage with a bucket next to your drum kit and still play the show flawlessly. I was just so impressed with him. Damn, and, um, <laughs> what a legend. <laughs> yeah, I told and um I mentioned it to the crowd and everyone was like, Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and he's in the back being he's like, in the you up, fucking asshole. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. so I want to talk about that that US tour because that's obviously when you guys were recording the album that we are here to talk about. Make mm-hmm. you suffer. Uh, I actually had a, a chat with Alex last week, so I have a few questions I want to talk to you about. She gave me some like inside gossip about the album. Oh, did um, she? She did. She did. But I want to hear from you, like what the experience was, because we've talked about it before with the singles you have released, and I think we chat a little bit in person at shows and we've seen you, but. I feel like you guys have just come in with this new era of the band that is the most concise, authentic version of what Make Them Suffer is. And it seems to be getting rewarded. Like just seeing the people at shows, the people online, everyone seems to be so about it. That must be super rewarding and and like justified for you guys of having to work so long and so hard to be where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. And I think... um... You know, with the bands, I feel like there has always been an upward trajectory, uh, so to speak. I don't think we would have continued if at any point it felt like, you know, we were taking steps backwards or um, anything like that. So that, I think there has been steady growth with the band. And uh, that that's something that I'm kind of proud of is that we never have really been like a hype band or whatever. We've just kind of like stuck to our guns and just like uh, continued and slogged it out. And over the course of time, you know, our fans are very loyal and a lot, a lot of our fans you'll see in the YouTube comments and stuff. And they've stuck with us since the EP, since the first record, and they're still listening to our music today, despite all those changes. But um, yeah, if there, if we were to look at the trajectory of the band, I would say that, yeah, there definitely has been a spike in the last uh, couple of years. And it's really exciting for us to see. We've never really felt like um, a whole, a whole lot of hype or anything like that behind the band. And it feels like that is actually a thing that, exists at the moment and um yeah it's a super exciting time and i think yeah we're just very proud of 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 you know a how long oh, we're proud of how long we've been going and kind of like our legacy and our history you know what i mean um i think like make them the story of make them suffer is like a, a story and i think people are becoming attached to that and then secondly i just think yeah this is you know it feels like this is our like st- strongest era um this is sound we're all really proud of and i think like the fact that we decided to um go with the self-titled uh album title for this one is um you almost know, like a rebirth yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah exactly yeah and it's proof that we are uh proud of of this and these new songs so yeah i, I think also, it's i'm oh, sorry you sorry go. i also think it's pretty cool to note that while you've got like it's self-titled album uh obviously alex's first album with the band um mm. and you know it's kind of like a new era and like nath said you sound like the most concise, uh, you know, like focused version of the band, mm. but it's also with so many different elements. Like it's it's a wider scope of sonic sounds and genre bending and dynamics than you guys have ever had mm. while still sounding like the album sounds like a complete journey with just a lot more ebb and flow than you've ever had. Mm. And for a metalcore band, like to be able to do that and still sound so packaged and so ready to go is pretty fucking cool oh thank you man appreciate you saying yeah i think the decision to um one thing that i think probably was a little bit restricting or you know we came to learn was um restricting to an extent was um you know a lot of the um the orchestration the the keyboard elements and stuff of the band um that layer that sits in the mix generally you know, when you're confined to the box of like um, classical instruments, it, um, it, you know, it is, it is restrictive in a sense, but, you know, once we've like branched out, you know, we have those elements, we have some piano on the record, but also we have, you know, uh, pads and, you know, pulsing synths and ones that are, synths that are percussive, you know, saws and all kinds of, um, yeah, I think it's, 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 it's just, um, it sort of opened up this this you know um, box of tools that we didn't have access to, and and I felt like you know now now we have the ability to add much more dynamics to our music, um, and I think that is uh, yeah one of the things that is definitely like um, the standouts of, of one of the standout elements of our new sound, I suppose. Yeah, 
I what I was gonna say before as well is like it feels like you're also having the most fun with it than we've ever seen mm. before. Like there is you can see the joy that's coming from performing this. Oh yeah, together. you can see it live. Obviously, man, we like... just came off the Suffer Forever tour and watching you guys a few nights yeah. in a row and just seeing being like you're clearly having fun with this. Mm. That's really, yeah. really cool to see. How much of your songwriting for this album were you considering the dynamic between yourself and Alex? Because obviously having had another vocalist with you in the past, mm. I feel like you've been able to lean into Alex a little bit more here. Was that a conscious decision knowing that you have her there? Or is it just like that's the way you're writing and it happens to be that you've got someone that helps out with that? Um. Well, I, I think that um, the way that I've always... Uh, phrased vocals over music has sort of you know uh lent itself to having someone else help like it, it a lot of the a lot of the lines and lyrics i've written like kind of actually make sense for two vocalists yeah and um there's been a lot of moments where uh, times in the in the past where like i've said hey jai can you do this line or nick can you do this and then we try to do it and just a doesn't sound good and like it's, it's hard for them to pull off while they're trying to play the music because it is you know it's not it's not the easiest they're not the easiest songs to play you know no, either it's quite technical yeah there's yeah. a lot going on so um yeah and then alex coming into the band um i don't know that for her for me like yeah her singing ability is amazing and i think a step above um what we've had in the past but having said that i i think the most interesting uh, aspects to Alex being in the band is our ability to bounce the screams off each other. Like that to me is the most, and that's super fun to write in the studio and just like bounce ideas off each other and just, Hey, scream this line. And we can kind of roll with the punches as we're writing. Um, that was amazing. A, a super, super fun experience um, to be in the studio with Alex and to work through those vocals. And uh, yeah, I, I think that's, if there's one thing that vocally gets me excited about um, our new sound, it's definitely like the back and forth on the screams more than anything. Um, yeah. Yeah. And obviously we got a taste of that, um, you know, when Doom Switch was dropped and and as you've released single after single, it, it was cool to see that kind of come to fruition over a, over a course of songs, but now getting to hear it in a full album, um, mm. you guys are obviously like really playing on that call and response, but not even just the screams, man, even with the cleans, the harmonies, the back and forth there, it has added a, a whole new element. Uh, but also it gives you a bit of a break, gives you a bit of a rest oh, on stage. Oh, <laughs> don't get me started on the benefits of that. I mean, that's, <laughs> I've been, I've been doing this 15 years, you know, my, my back's, my back hurts. My foot. Nah, um, nah, that, that is definitely a big bonus. Um, and it was pretty funny actually when we were recording, uh, well, sorry, when I was writing um, Doom Switch and, um, you know, Alex had just joined the band and uh, she lived in Melbourne. Uh, we lived, still lives in Melbourne and I was in Perth. I did my recordings in Perth, um, recorded the majority of the vocals and sent that to them. And then I sent, uh, you know, Nick, Nick went into the studio with Alex to record her lines and I'd sent them a document and um, highlighted, you know, the lines that she was doing kind of thing. And I'd laid down a demo track for the, the melody that she was going to sing over the chorus. And um, just, you know, I, I screamed her lines as well for placeholder. So she knew where those screams were, but when I got the demo back, the, you know, doom switch is like, but you know, she's always doing that yeah. response to me. Uh, when I got the track back, she'd sung those lines, as in like sung, sung something. Sung, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was like, "What? What are you guys doing? Those those were meant to be screamed." And and just I think it was never communicated, I suppose. But I think they were just so taken back. They're like, "Whoa, yeah, we can do that." <laughs> it was like this <laughs> exciting moment for everyone. That's um, a cool thing as well. Yeah. To I guess for her to have the like you instantly put in the trust in her to be like I know that you can deliver this thing the way I envision because yeah. they might have gone and been like well this is the traditional way that making stuff is record the vocals mm. but mm. you'd been like no no like I know you can do this so just go do it yeah that's that must be a cool moment also of like welcome for her of like well Sean's trusting me to not fuck this up yeah yeah no for sure I think she was um yeah she was so she was stoked to, she was like she was like oh so it's an honor that you want me to scream on the <laughs> on the music but also she um she like uh has had had it also changed her screaming style coming in to make them suffer so in drown the city i i mean i actually don't i'm not good with this technical terms i don't know she, there's fry and false anyway she used to do one and then she changed to the other yeah and uh 
she's now doing the same one that I do, basically. So the the sounds, the ton, tonality, uh, tonally cohesive. screams blend quite well together. Yeah, um, for sure. It sounds much more full, I think, her scream now. So that's cool. And now on the other side of the vocals, talk to me mm. about your cleans. Because Jody and I would just, before this, listen to the album through. I made him work out with me and we listened to the album. Still uh, feeling it, bro. Don't ever do it. It's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, PR was like, I'm going to make you guys work out together. That'd be sick. You're lucky you're so far away. <laughs> um, there's a bit more of like a on slow vibes in some of your vocals, particularly in, and I'm going to butcher the, the way you pronounce this, mm. the, what's the, the after Venus, Venusian? Venusian? Is that how you pronounce it? Venusian? Do you know something? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's a word that uh, I, I basically was like, uh, synonyms for alien. <laughs> and oh. uh, Venusian came up. Um, but it's kind of like, I think it's, um, like a, like a made up word really, but I looked it up context, too. It works for the context of the song. So a Venusian is, uh, like a Martian, but from Venusian. Venus. There we go. Venusian, Venusian, Venusian sounds way better yeah. than Venusian. Yeah. Venusian. Okay. Yeah. See in Venusian blues, now the word we yeah. know how to all pronounce together. Mm. You have like your, your cleans there. It's a tone you haven't really used in making supper before. Yeah. Well, that's it. And I remember um, during the recording process sitting in the bar with Nick and I was, you know, we'd tried a couple different different um, choruses and I said, I'm really, this is the one that's sticking with me. You know, I really want to do this. And he was like, well, you know, I think it, it's cool, but I think it's going to be uh, maybe alienating for our current fan base because we've never done something like this. And it's just not something you would expect to make them suffer. And, I was like, look, uh, I basically like pleaded with him. I was like, look, man, the this, you know, I think every song or every album, you know, there's songs that we each have that I think kind of um, showcase a little bit of our, our personality or ones that represent us as people. And, you know, like a, a good example, I think, would be on uh, Worlds Apart, you know, um, P- Power Overwhelming, the riffs in that. Like that's such a Nick song. Like we sure. that song is on the album because Nick was so that's like showcasing Nick's guitar work and just like his personality through his guitar work in a way. Um, and I was like, that, that's this for me. Like, this is what I want to, you know, this is the way I sing in Onslow. This is how I like to sing. This is a sound that I like. And, you know, I just, I, I really like this uh, chorus. So can we do it? And yeah, he let me. So <laughs> it still <laughs> sounds. Thank like... you, boss Nick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was in trouble. Well, there is, I'll, I'll go into that part, but I feel like you both had to have some compromises because uh, that's part of the, the Alex gave me the inside scoop on no hard feelings. I hear that Nick was like, kind of put the hard line of you of like, figure this shit out. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, basically, um, I'd written, I mean, that song we wrote, I wrote probably like 10 choruses for, which like, you know, you hear so, so, uh, stories about like Blink-182 and they write like 100 choruses for a song and it's like, all right, well, whatever. But for me, 10, 10 choruses is a lot to write for one song, especially given the time constraints we had. You know, this was less than three weeks, you know, a little over two weeks, and four of those days were spent re- uh, recording drums. Mm. Uh, I actually tracked all the drums. So it was a lot. Uh, of songwriting to be uh, pushed into such a small uh, space. And I, no, it's not to say I did, wasn't prepared. Like I did come with some amount of lyrics, but a lot of it, like the majority of the album, I would say the lyrics did, um, yeah, were, were in, uh, written in the studio. Um, I just find that that's how I've I've done it a lot in the past and it's the way that I've always been comfortable doing that. I did that for Never Bloom. I did that for the EP. I did that for every record we've ever done. Yeah, I feel um, like when, you, when you're in the studio and you're hearing the songs come together, like pre-pro is one thing, but I'm yeah. the same. Like I'll, I'll have basically the body, but when I hear things actually how they're going to essentially sound once it's released, it can completely give you a new like perspective on it and go, oh, that's not actually going to work with this. The, the, you know, like the vibe is different. The dynamic is different. Yeah. And if you're written, if it's all written within the same space, like they tend to have a more like a unified kind of um, theme. It's all part of the same writing session. So it's all, you know, that's, you know, it, it gives consistency to the record, I think. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So I wrote something like 10 choruses for that one. And there was one, what, there was one in particular that I thought was the best chorus, but uh, Nick didn't like it. And then I just started going 
you know, I had a bit of a Nick and I butt heads quite a few times because for me, it felt like the chorus of that song, um, the progression uh, moved too slowly um, for a, uh, you know, a solid or like catchy uh, vocal hook to really sit over the top of. So he didn't, uh, you know, I I tried chopping it up and like speeding up the the speed at which the chords progressed sort of thing um, to get something catchier and, and you know, he didn't want to budge on that. So um, basically uh, we just like left that song to the very, very last minute um, was was how it ended up happening. And we like, it had been such a, like a slog and such a tight, time frame that by the time we got to the end of the uh recording process you know the idea of leaving the the studio with one song to be recorded at home was just like putting us in tears like yeah. I just mm. not want to have to deal with like I just want to finish and like this space be the album recording and and songwriting space and then like I don't want to have to think about this anymore when I get home like it's it already our brains were so taxed from the process um yeah and then i guess in the last uh i le left that song till very the very last day and then like in the last probably like 10 hours of our time in the studio i wrote the lyrics of that song um and yeah we recorded it we had a, a like a our flight was at like 6 a.m so we had to catch a <clears throat> or 7 a.m i think it was and then so we had to catch a a uh, taxi at about 4:30 a.m. and I recorded uh, the last scream on the record to, uh, to in that song at about 4:30 and then we just got or about four o'clock sorry and then we got straight into the taxi and left. So, <laughs> yeah, and was listening back process. now, how do you feel about that song? Does it did like can you sit there and be like, yeah, we did it justice, or do you feel like you would have liked anything different on there? That song is, um, I don't know um the the for the listeners that haven't heard the album um that song is like uh I guess you could say like the emotional one on the album and um we'll sit on this until the album's out so by the time yeah, we yeah. So oh, okay. the album yeah yeah. yeah 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 it's like the emotional song on the album I guess you could say and for me um I wasn't really in a headspace where I really wanted to um I didn't want to be in that headspace to write those kind of lyrics and to write that kind of song. And I think that was like also maybe a contributing factor as to why I kind of just kept pushing it back and leaving it to the last minute and had that song be the last song that I wrote. And I did end up touching up a line back in um, Australia once we once we finished the song because I realised it was a bit rushed and changed one or two things in the end there. But, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't quite remember what the question was, but yeah, it was. Yeah, was where the... do you stand at now? But it's like, so. Oh yeah, so uh, when I first heard it, that was the standout. Like that was my first song. I was like, oh, new favorite song on the album. That yeah, right. instantly okay. stood out to me. As yeah, like, yeah. And it's, then it's to hear still the story in my, about it's still it. in my top three on the album for sure. I'm interested yeah. to hear your perspective, knowing the backstory of like the recording process. I so I I just I generally don't really like listening to um those types of songs from us. Like if I am listening to our discography, I will always uh i can't like i can't really sit through like save yourself or um you know i can't really sit through uh you know let me in is another one and a lot of those okay. more melodic um emotional songs i just i can't really sit through them i don't really like um is listening that because it's so real for you from like the perspective you've written from yeah yeah maybe it sort of takes me back to the headspace i was in when i wrote that uh... song i don't really like yeah I don't really yeah. like revisiting those feelings. It's sort of like it's 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 kind of tor it's real torture, you know. Like uh, asking someone, to, you know, hey, can you think about like the darkest, you know, stuff in your life and admit some stuff to a whole bunch of people that don't know you and put that on a song and and know, now go listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> how do you go? How do you go performing those live then? Obviously, you haven't performed the that newest track live, but how do you go performing <laughs> those then? Because you have to obviously still get yourself into a headspace where you do the right thing, where you do a good job and sell it to the crowd. But do you have like an internal sort of struggle with what you're thinking about and what you're singing about? Or do you just kind of, when it's live, do you get to just kind of go in autopilot and this is my job? Yeah, no, I think we, I mean, our, we haven't really played many songs like that live. Honestly, they're, they're songs we tend to avoid. We haven't, we've, I don't think we've ever played Save Yourself Live. I don't think we've uh, played Let Me In in a number of years. Because um, part of that is because, I don't really want to. <laughs> the other part of that is because um, 
you know, we like our our set to be fun and energetic and upbeat. I think in the recent uh, Suffer Forever tour, I suppose you could say The Attendant was like a softer song that we played live. And I think we really enjoyed that because of like just how different that was dynamically from the rest of the songs in our set. You know, the fact that it was just like act- actual singing and just like a rock backbeat sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of the metal that we like to play live, definitely... Um, it's the high octane, you know, you're in a heavy metal like blade yeah. you know, or something like that. That's but that's yeah. Dude, you know that once people hear this album, especially with sort of how much free reign Alex gets on that track, you know mm. the fans are gonna want it. So prepare. Oh, we will. Like we'll we'll play it hundred percent. Like it's gonna yeah. Yeah, we're definitely I was gonna start the petition now for the emotional make them suffer <laughs> tour. And you'd be there be like, damn my talent in songwriting. Why did I do this? It's too real, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say though, like, and I did say this to you after the Suffer Forever tour. Hearing you do the tenant, like you crushed the clean vocals in that. It was really cool to have, I think, that like change up in that moment. Yeah. Yeah, because it's not just balls to the wall the whole time there was mm. like a really cool, like take a step back, watch this song and appreciate it and feel it. Mm. I think you need to have that. And that's like, you've done a good job with, I think, positioning of No Hard Feelings. Like having it like track seven, it gives mm. a really good el- ebb and flow to the album and, and allows you to have that like emotional standpoint before you're back into fucking hitting hard again. Yeah. Oh, no, I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. Yeah, I think the everyone, when we did that tour and played the attendant, everyone was um saying it was their favorite part of the song, uh, set because you know they get they get a breather basically <laughs> super cruisy for everyone so and and for me too like even though i am like you know i'm i'm, I'm kind of singing and performing but like you know it's it's much slower i can kind of take breaths between each line and yeah not moving around heaps so yeah um it was quite fun and uh, a new experience never played a song like that live before um so yeah enjoyed it a lot what are you most <laughs> excited for playing off the new stuff that you haven't played yet? Um, uh, Small Town Syndrome for sure. I think Small Town Syndrome is just like, it's just got this energy that like I want to rap along to it. You know what I mean? And I just think it's 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 super fun. I think the vocal delivery, I'm, it's it's probably, yeah, it's my, maybe my favourite song we've ever written and probably my favourite song that, uh, in terms of the the lyrics and the vocal writing, I just really think it's it's super fun and upbeat. And yeah, I'm keen to um, give some mic shares out to that one or something. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That one, that one's uh, very excited about that one. Um, uh, other ones, I'd say. Well, we still haven't played Manigod live, and I am looking forward to that one. But um, my lungs will be hating me because that's yeah it's going to be a workout <laughs> yeah, yeah i'm just going to be put, yeah. put planted on the fold back just power stance <laughs> go for gold uh no moving around for me that one um yeah uh tether i think is is going to be a really fun one just because we haven't had a nice bouncy track in a while and i think it's it's going to be a fun bouncy one for live um and i i am excited to play uh what was the one we were just talking about the no emotional hard feelings no hard feeling. I am excited to play No Hard Feelings, actually, because that is, uh, while that is an emotional one, it's still upbeat compared yeah. to a lot of other uh, emotional True. ones that I was talking about before. They weren't really upbeat, but like the, the, the like the like intro, you know, tremolo with um, uh, Alex uh, singing over it. It's like a trance song or something. Like it yeah. just sounds beautiful. And I, I think that vocal line there, like I had had that melody in my head for since. That was originally going. That riff and that vocal melody was originally going to be how the song "Contraband" started, oh. and we found it. It was really difficult to make work within the arrangement of the song. So I've been hanging on to that melody for the longest time, and I was so just um, honestly, I started welling up when I heard Alex's take because I was like, "Yes, it's just how I envisioned we it." We finally She's did amazing the thing yeah, and cool. doing this part, and I was so proud of it. So yeah, um, that one's going to be awesome to play live, definitely. What one are you looking forward to the least in terms of, um, not in terms of like what you dislike to play live, but in terms of. um, Yeah, not just this, but in your set list, there is a song that you play that is like, oh, I've got to do this now. And is it because it's like taxing or. Yeah. Um, uh, Well, I think that um, just the, just like, I hope I don't upset anyone by saying this, but I think just the older songs in general, 
like um, Blood Moon and Widower on the previous tour, I really like those songs uh, to listen to. But I would say that um, the way we write now, um, we have a uh, we're not actively thinking about how a song is going to be translated for a live setting. I don't think that's something that is really on our radar. But I think naturally our song writing has like evolved in a way that the newer stuff tends to be more fun to perform live and tends to flow better for a live setting. Sure. Um, and I think that, you know, um, you know, Blood Moon, for example, is a song with a lot of like very jarring like tempo changes. And maybe it's just maybe it's just like the hooks aren't don't feel as strong to me or something like that. It just could be something as simple as that. But yeah, it's probably just the older old, older stuff. I think, you know, Widow was always cool as like because that's really throwbacky and like I think yeah. that's a really cool song for us. Yeah. And it's actually a pretty special moment in a set if we ever do play that song. Um, but yeah, I would say just in a general sense, I prefer playing the newer stuff to the older stuff, but you know, everyone says that. So <laughs> what about like, have you had the difficult discussions of what of the older songs, you know, in the previous sets will be rotated out to make way for new songs yet? Because you guys have obviously, you're all very clearly when it comes to the songwriting and decision-making, as you've just said, between you and Nick, you're all very like stand firm and strong. That, first of all, that's such a great thing for a band to be able to have those strong personalities that can butt heads, but come to a decision without it causing drama. Yeah, have, have the difficult discussions about what gets rotated out to make way for new stuff happened. Um, yeah, but I think it's it's usually, um, you know, we're, we're usually in agreement about what songs are coming and going, and like for for whatever reason, you know, we, you know, on this tour, you know, we we wanted to play like a song or two from um, Worlds Apart. Uh, Vortex was like, all right, we're playing that one, but for whatever reason, we were all just like, you know. We could have picked any of the songs. I mean, Fireworks was the single, but, you know, we were all just really, everyone everyone had started listening to the song Uncharted again for some reason and decided that that was a really cool track and that we wanted to to play that live. And I, I want to thank you for that. That's yeah. still to this day one of my favourite tracks you guys have ever done. Oh, cheers. Yeah. I, I, I was so that. stoked you put that in. Yeah. No, it's, it's just a good positive energy um, and fun and it's bouncy. You know, it's always nice having a really bouncy track on to... to in, yeah live set um so i don't know yeah usually we, it's it's pretty unanimous in terms of what we want to play live of the older um catalog no one really yeah uh it's also <laughs> especially if we're like if we're playing some super deep cuts from the back catalog um and it's ones we have i a have never played before or b um haven't played in a very very long time then it's like more work for us because we've got to go back and learn all those songs again and oh, yeah, uh, yeah. jam them out and stuff. And that, that, that was, but you know, that can be a, a super rewarding experience. And that was one of the coolest things about the never bloom tour, I think was like getting to play songs like the well. And like that ended up being, in my opinion, like the highlight, like one of the highlights of that set for me, I was like, you know, this song actually like fucks and uh, it really holds up to, um, you know, a, a modern day, like it's, it's, it's one of the more like modern sounding songs on that album, I suppose. And I think yeah. it translated really well for a live audience. It was really cool to play because we basically played that song live, like all of once in our whole career. And yeah. Really and you cool. can kind of see where you guys were headed with tracks like that as well. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. With the, the way that your music has evolved over time, starting off being like, so kind of like death Corey, death metally heavy, to get towards the the metal scene you're in now it meant it's meant that you've the bands you've toured with have probably changed quite dramatically like obviously the nether bloom tour was quite heavy and like mm. dark but then being able to play with like you bring me and sleep token mm. there's like a wider range going forwards give us give us some bands you would like to play with let's manifest them together who <laughs> would you like to see make them stuff a play with in the future um that you haven't already played with man that's okay haven't already played with i mean there's just so many it's so hard to say i mean for me i mean a buckle like a buckle list would be obviously like deftones for me or you Mm -hmm. know mature like it would be super cool it'd be cool to branch into you know do some more like metal metal tours we haven't really done played a super metal, like non-metal core metal tour. Um, would love to do something like that. Are you really that keen to have like a crowd of 
50 year old men hate you <laughs> <laughs> um yeah <laughs> that's the challenge i like it's that. a good challenge I think, I think, though yeah no, yeah yeah that's right you've got to convert them and um you know i think if you can please like a super elitist crowd of people with their arms crossed to the back of the room then uh yeah you can sky's the limit sort of thing <laughs> um, but uh, you know that's sort of that's sort of like elite like you know gatekeepers um culture has always been like a, a you know rampant in metal and you know i remember like being you know when we first started and people were like oh you guys aren't real metal and stuff like that especially when you know deathcore was first starting and yeah you know, i was a pretty early band back then i suppose and yeah um there used to be a lot of elitism in metal but i think i think that's um i think that's uh you know a uh a lovable trope of like the standard metal head and it's it's one that I stand behind and yeah yeah behind and yeah I'd love to do some more metal tours is the long and short of that um I mean Metallica you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> dream big baby I love that but Metallica yeah. you know like they're they're taking bands like Architects and Ice Nine Kills who really yeah. like that's right know, do not fit the mold of Metallica especially if you've got like a band like Ice Nine Kills <laughs> that have the whole stage persona horror mm. element I mean yeah. yeah, I can't um, see Metallica I'll, fans loving that. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, and on that as well, I think, um, yeah, I'd, we'd love to tour with, um, yeah, Ice Nine would be awesome. I think Motionless and White would be really cool because yeah, that'd um, be fun. I only got to see, we played a, a crossover show when we were on the Parkway package in America and they were doing their headliner and the two bills coincided for like a mini festival one day and cool. We had to get out of there. We had to get to the next show. So unfortunately, we only got to see one song of the uh, motionless live performance. But I mean, it was a spectacle. Like the live production was amazing, and I would I would love to watch that every night. I think they're a really cool uh, special band. And then like you know, Spirit Box as well. We did their um, <clears throat> side show when they came over here for I can't remember what music festival it was. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not uh, the first year. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So played that and, you know, we haven't toured with them since after the burial and they've just, you know, had a moment and we've had a moment and I think that band is really special and writes really special music. And like, I love the the, the visual identity of the band as well. Like the music video for Celador, I think is so sick and just yeah, dark. Yeah. Yeah. Like they're the also, they're well overdue to come back here as well. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. So I think we'd leap at an opportunity like that as well. I mean, there's so many great bands out there at the moment. I think like metal's having a bit of a moment and I'm really stoked about that. I think it's because of bands like Spirit Box and Bad Omens and Sleep Token, et cetera, that are like bringing in this new generation of people and uh, of listeners and it's it's awesome to see and like it's it's converting and they're coming to shows and yeah, you know, bands are growing and it's great. It's cool to see, like, I think social media has had such a huge positive impact on the heavy music scene. Like, seeing, like, TikTok, it was not made for metal bands, but seeing there's a huge, like, metal community on there that's finding these, like, new artists. And, mm. like, obviously, like, reaction channels. That's a thing that didn't exist yeah. when you guys first started. That's become, like, well, this is, like, a major form of journalism for a lot of bands. That's right. How, how aware are you of the comments and, like, watching that other stuff? Because, like, we never really noticed to start with until bands started being like, oh yeah, we watch all the videos. We we watch everything you guys yeah, do. We're like, oh shit, we better say nice things. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, like how aware of that are you? And and I know you've done like plenty of interviews mm -hmm. with like us and like Nick and a bunch of other like reactor spaces before. Do you pay attention to the comments of what people are saying? Yes. <laughs> I'd like to pretend that I'm too cool for school and like don't read all the comments and stuff like that. But for sure, like um, for a, you know, a solid uh, 24 to 36 hours after like a new song is released, I will like keep tabs on what people think of a song and how the reactions are going and everything. Um, sometimes it's uh, <laughs> gut wrenching and <laughs> other times it's, uh, you know, very invigorating. Um, yeah. And, you know, we're, we're a band that tends to, tends to naturally, um, attract a lot of uh, very like varied responses, very mixed mm. responses. Uh, I think, you know, partly because, you know, our catalog is so diverse and every album and sounds quite different from the rest. Um, but also because, um, yeah, I, I guess, it, you know, it's, it's so interesting to me when I see people that are like, you know, one person will be like, Oh, the new single 
don't sound as good. I think Ghost of Me was but the only good new one. And then other people would be like, well, Doom Switch is, the, is my favourite. And then some people like Epitaph, you know, and you just see oh, everyone's got these mixed responses. I guess that's a, a, a positive thing. Um, maybe. Yeah, because everyone's, everyone's going to have different tastes and different opinions. And I think yeah. the worst thing about social media, I mean, it's, it's also a great thing with comments when you're getting good responses. But within mm. that first, like, 24 to 36 hours when people are having that initial listen to something for the first time, mm you're getting their initial thought you, and it, usually it's either one extreme or the other. They either viciously yeah. hate it or they absolutely adore it. And yeah. it's something that we even doing this have had to be more conscious of going, you have to try and take it in and process it as best you can from so many different perspectives of where you are at the, at the time, what the band is doing, because yeah. what we say on our first listen to something, people are going to see and take as gospel. Mm. And in a day or a month, we might feel entirely different about a song. Yeah. The thing that I always, I always, I always see it like this, like people when the first time you listen to a song, if you're like, all right, a band puts out a new single and it's with a music video and you as a listener, as a long time fan of that band will check it out i mean it's not the usual uh context in which you're supposed to listen to music you're not like intently watching a music like that's not how we ingest music in our day-to-day lives yeah. you know like it typically like i might be driving and chuck something on and then be headbanging in the car or something like that you know that might be how yeah. i'll listen to music or if i'm at the gym or something like that it's not like this like okay i'm listening i'm watching i'm paying attention to every little like note and detail and i think people forget that sometimes when they're checking out new music that, you know, music is not, it's not meant to be like a, you know, as entertaining as like a film or a TV show. It's just like something to get a vibe going and to have a mosh to and to uh headbang to when you're driving or in the gym or what, whatever it is you're doing, you know? And yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. The other thing is, is like when you I feel like, especially in the like reaction video space as well <laughs> um, in particular, a lot of reactors and people who are watching reaction channels, they're all waiting for that specific thing. And if that specific thing doesn't come, whether it be a breakdown or a yeah. blare or a whatever, yeah, it completely alters their opinion on a song and changes their decision. And they get this initial reaction. Like it didn't have that one thing that I wanted that it used to have. So therefore it's not as good. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a knee jerk thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, yeah. But you know, if you, yeah. I think that is that is true and like you know a lot of you need for viewers on a lot of those channels you know people need the screenshot of them going and that's like, <laughs> we, we, we've decided that they really just own this year or whatever like it is we had a big talk about it yeah. literally yesterday because i was like so we all the other reactors for that my particular song i'm not gonna throw anyone on the bus but they, we looked through and there was like all the same reaction and then johnny and i were doing something dumb in our thumbnail that we always do yeah, yeah. and i was yeah. like no wonder we don't get as many views because we don't do the thing that gets people to click the thing because it's not us going yeah <laughs> with a lot and they nah, did on you guys staying staying true to yourselves that's good I like man it. we're here to we're here to listen to music objectively because we love music we're not here to find the biggest breakdown of 2024 we're not here to be like you know the mm. heaviest thing we've ever heard we just like music and it's also been cool like you say like the flip side of why you write music people do really want to hear more from the artists I think yeah. it's fucking cool that you're like you're taking the time to spend an hour talking with us about the new album because people will have questions and it gives a better insight. I think it can help form a new attachment for the music because that's what we have. Mm. We have some people like, oh, I didn't listen to that song because you guys hadn't reacted to it yet. I wanted to see what you guys said about it. Yeah. That's such an interesting thing to me because it shows that people actually want more out of their music than necessarily just the headbang, just the bop along. They actually want to get a better understanding and it's cool having artists like yourself taking the time to kind of do that. Even if it's not necessarily how you, why you write the music, there's definitely something there that people can grab hold of. And I think it's cool that you're giving an opportunity for people to kind of understand yeah. where you've come from a bit more. Yeah, for sure. I agree entirely. And I think a lot of people will like listen to a song and go like, oh, uh, I wouldn't have done that in the songwriting. That's a mistake or whatever. But like then, you know, when you, you know, all it takes is for you to like see an interview with the artist or like, hear them talk about that song and the decision uh the decisions behind uh that songwriting to understand oh this was all like intentional like you know this, yeah. this is very tied to the song for these reasons and whatever then it's just the way it is yeah yeah well we appreciate you we're stoked you made the time and also we're stoked on the album genuinely i think you guys as we said we've there's 
a clear excitement in the band and that translates. And I mm. think people are going to fall in love with this as a whole package, which is really cool. So well done. Yeah, look, I, I think that like as a whole package, this album, it, it does sound like a rebirth. It sounds like you guys. I just think you guys have done a great job of, you know, saying, look, if this is going to be a rebirth, this is where we're going to try some new shit. It's come across really well. Production's great. The riffs are great. The vocal play between you guys, like, you know, the the rhythm section sounds as tight and as groovy as ever. Um, I think these songs are going to absolutely fucking rip live. Yeah, I can't wait to see you play it with Metallica. It's going to be sick. <laughs> me neither me neither <laughs> sick uh well thank you guys for having me i appreciate it um yeah i'm super stoked on 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 the record as, as i said before and yeah i can't wait for everyone to hear it it's gonna be amazing now it's out everyone go stream it check it out now and uh show them we'll see you real soon my dude hey thanks guys thanks dude see ya bye